So uh, today we'll be talking about religious deconstruction, and I just kind of want to take the temperature of the room. When I say deconstruction, do you know what that means? Uh, just kind of raise your hand if you kind of have a grasp. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think it's, uh, I realized this morning as I printed out my sermon that there might be some discrepancies between uh, the evangelical church in which I was raised, how they talk about deconstruction, and how uh, mainline Protestant folks talk about religious deconstruction. So someone much smarter than I am can give you uh, Jacques Derrida, who's a French philosopher's actual definition of deconstruction and philosophical and literary analysis. Um, but for the purposes of today's sermon, when I say deconstruction, uh, the following is kind of the definition that we're going with. Um, it's from Hamin's Hubner's book, uh, Deconstructing Evangelicalism. Deconstruction simply refers to the process of questioning one's own beliefs that were once considered unquestionable due to new experiences, reading widely, engaging in conversations with the other, and interacting in a world that is now more connected and exposed to religious diversity than ever before. So deconstruction in the church, uh, at least in some of the churches that I was raised in, is a, another one of those boogeyman words, kind of like critical race theory, that people sure are afraid of considering, honestly, how little they really know what it's all about. Um, I'm not an expert on this topic, but today's sermon is part sermon, part testimony on my own deconstruction process, this own process of engaging with new ideas, reading widely, as the, you know, the definition sort of listed before. Um, this, I feel, is really important to talk about because I consider myself a spiritual refugee from conservative evangelicalism and have found myself as close to home as I think I'll ever get within the mainline Protestant tradition. So the, my deconstruction of the tradition in which I was raised is also rather inseparable from my queerness uh, and the reason, and part of the reason why I'm at this church today. We have to talk about deconstruction, I think, in this church specifically, because as a proudly open and affirming and anti-racist, progressive, and inclusive congregation, there's a pretty good chance that a lot of us are here because we are also spiritual refugees as well. If we really want to value the process of progress, we have to talk about what it means to deconstruct, keeping in mind that God's vision for us is always restorative after the deconstructed after the deconstruction and reconstructive. So I spent my last summer in evangelicalism working out at the Hills, which is a summer camp uh, and retreat center owned and operated by the Free Methodist Church. I'd essentially grown up out at the Hills, shoving rocks up my nose and crashing my bike into trees and harassing the lifeguards by playing dead in the lake just to kind of keep them on their toes. And that summer, uh, that last summer, summer of 2018, I spent eight weeks trying to keep children from doing the same shenanigans that I did as a kid uh, alongside my sister and with about 20 other college students. So it was the summer after an incident at my college that I know that I've mentioned from the pulpit before in which a member of the community surrounding my university verbally harassed and assaulted myself and other members of the queer community and the queer student body. It was a harrowing moment of homophobia in which I began to realize that I could no longer personally belong to or involve myself in an institution that was unapologetic about how it believed that I am less than and that, that I deserve less than compared to my cisgender and heterosexual counterparts. I could not, with respect to myself and the image of God within me, remain in the church that I, that I was raised in but it wasn't until the summer after that incident, several months later, that I decided that I would leave the evangelical church. But I was on the fence. Where would I go? What church would accept me? It was this unquestionable belief that I had been raised with that queer people had no place in the church, and I would obviously eventually find spaces that affirmed my personhood. But this isn't a sermon about getting out. This isn't a sermon about staying in. This is a sermon about the tension in between. So in biblical terms, the wilderness. I spent most of my precious allotted, I maybe had like one hour breaks in the whole week of working with campers out at the hills that summer. We should have unionized, but I spent all of that free time just walking in the woods. And you can walk for miles in these trails out at the hills uh, without seeing any trace of civilization. 
And it's because I spent my summers as a child when I wasn't wreaking havoc, just riding my bike and walking around these paths, spending time, uh, spending time alone, spending time in nature. And I knew these trails I, because of my childhood. And I always found my way back to at least the A-frames or the high ropes or Farrand Road. And from there, could kind of make my way back to where I needed to go. The woods for me are a really deeply contemplative space uh, in which for years I found solace and comfort. Though it was not without some risk, you know, no matter how familiar you are with the trail, you don't know what's going to happen on that trail. And see, the wilderness, uh, spiritual or otherwise, is a difficult place to be, but its difficulty does not preclude the wonder that you can find there. The text today, so beautifully read by Alice, Psalm 42, is a psalm of lament in which the speaker is a Korahite or a son of Korah, musical leaders in the temple. It is also called a masquil or a song of contemplation. It's also a song that takes place in the wilderness, and we see so many depictions throughout scripture of people wandering in the wilderness, from Hagar to the Israelites to Elijah to John the Baptist to Jesus. Um, Wow, you don't get to hear yourself like that. But uh, yeah, from Hagar, that these, uh, that the wilderness shows people in this wonderful liminal space, all these supernatural signs. And you can see people have seen the presence of God. They've also met the adversary. And these wondrous signs are present and obvious. And wondrous not as overwhelming, um, overwhelmingly positive or always great, but just as overwhelming as causing one to question the unquestionable and do what? Either change entirely what you believe or remain steadfast as Jesus did when confronted by the adversary in what you believe. But what we are often presented with in wilderness is paradigm shifting, or at least it makes us question the validity of what we believe so that we can more strongly assert it. Beautiful wonder or awful wonder. Either way, the wilderness is a place to be tested and challenged in between one stage of life, one stage of motion, and the other. And I found myself entering this wilderness after several months of just kind of hanging out in a liminal space following girls' time, my first week counseling out at the hills. So girls' time is what the girls do when they split the camp into boys and girls. So girls' time can consist of many things, uh, not limited to, but including tying bricks to your ankle, uh, playing something called glitter pong in which you dump cups of glitter on your head, And the, you know, the reinforcement of traditional gender roles through the use of religious language. I don't know what the boys do. I wasn't invited. I'm kind of glad that I wasn't invited. But I have heard that, uh, anyway, the the counselor with whom I shared a duplex with that week and I found ourselves with a free hour towards one of the last evenings of our first week at camp. So with this in mind, uh, this was when the camp usually had camp girls' time and camp boys' time, but we decided to scale it down, combine our two cabins together, and do it ourselves. In the name of social-emotional learning, positive female relationships, we were going to revise what girls' time was about. So we laid out these index cards for the girls to write down uh, discussion questions, really anything that they wanted to know, um, and we would screen them before we read them out loud for the group to discuss. And I remember a very specific question in which the other counselor and I were asked by a kid who was sure if they were gay, if being gay was actually a sin. And this I remember. I remember holding the card in my hand and internally forming my response to the question before the other counselor reminded me of what we were instructed at staff training to do when a child asks questions about homosexuality broadly, um, just to tell them to ask their pastor. We were told not to give our opinion on it, no matter what our opinion was. Um, And in the church in which I was raised, however, asking your pastor results in a number of things in being taught non-affirming theology at best and conversion therapy at worst. And I remember saying nothing. And I should have at least said, regardless, you are precious and loved by God. And this was This was another one of those final straws that eventually drew me out of evangelicalism. It was my own silence. It was my own complicity in the systems of homophobia that were actively harming me as well as other children of God. I had to get out. This is what launched me for the next year into the wilderness, a place where I was tested. And it was difficult. 
I remember I spent a lot of that summer trying to decide whether to even remain enrolled in my undergraduate program because it was affiliated with the church in which I was raised. I doubted. I cried a lot in my shower to Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. And crying out to God was the closest I could just get to praying that, that those days. That was my prayer. And I did this all while leading children week by week to Jesus, while wrestling with the reality that the beliefs that I once held were actually these really fragile things when it came, when it came abruptly against my lived experience. I was thirsty. I was really thirsty. Or in other words, I just wanted something deeper, something that was closer to the heart of Jesus that I knew, something that acknowledged the ways in which I am also other and loves me regardless. That summer before I left evangelicalism, I had to do a lot of reflection and contemplation. And this psalm is a really good psalm for that endeavor. It, it depicts a deer having sprinted to safety away from a predator or perhaps just thirsty in the drought of the desert, longing for the quench of water, and having spent a lot of time in the woods out at the hills, walking paths mostly trod by white-tailed deer and other little critters. Um, I know that deer are pretty simple creatures. I've also had enough, you know, middle-of-the-road encounters with deer to know that they don't really think much before they do things. Um, there's really no space between instinct and impulse. And when they want to cross a road, they do. And when they are thirsty, they just seek the water. They just go. It is a base instinct to satisfy this thirst. They don't complicate the matters. They just simply return to what they need and what they know, that the water satisfies. Ultimately, my deconstruction led me to a simpler Christianity that takes Jesus at his word, that takes him seriously when he says that really there is no greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. And whatever you do for the least of these siblings, you do for me. I have found a Christianity that leans into the original radical leanings of the gospel to do right by the poor and to champion the orphan and the widow among us. A Christianity that prioritizes, rightfully so, the voices of the marginalized. Because the deconstruction of traditional religion and the reconstruction into something more liberating is, the, is most powerful when it's coming from the prophetic voices of marginalized people against whom this tradition was weaponized. And as a queer person, I can testify to this. And as we honor Juneteenth and the powerful means of resistance that reclaimed religion was in the lives of African people who were enslaved and the lives of their descendants, we honor what a professor of mine, Reverend Dr. Jose Francisco Morales Torres, who preached here on Palm Sunday, calls retrieval as resistance. The act of retrieving that which was formed against you to be used for your liberation. That was one of the fruits of my deconstruction that I was able to reclaim the religion that was used to hurt me and used to hurt other queer people of faith. This fruit of my deconstruction was this more honest Christianity. And deconstruction is not the boogeyman that will bring about the end of the church, but the revival that we have been waiting for that will restore the church to a, a more loving image of itself. A church that is humble enough to admit when it is wrong. A church that can be tested. For the church is not God. A church whose thirst is quenched from the living waters, that this is the church that people are searching for, this deeper church, this community that satisfies the thirst. This is the church that people are searching for, that matches the radical life of Jesus that they were taught about growing up, that they were taught to take seriously. But deconstruction can be a really painful thing. When you are daring to look outside of the boundaries of the community that you belong to to face the wilderness, it's isolating especially if nobody accompanies you on your way out. Deconstruction has to be something that the church can support people through. I am not particularly fond of my mother's militaristic language, but I was pitching the sermon to her on the phone last night, and she said, you know, the church is the only army that shoots its own wounded, um, that we have to be attuned to these specific needs of people who are in the process of doubt because they are worthy of that care. We are worthy of that care. And there's also a lot to be learned from religious deconstruction. A friend of mine, a graduate of, Vander, a graduate of Vanderbilt Divinity School, whom I've asked to speak at my seminary on the topic of deconstruction, once tweeted this, and it's a little long, but I hope that you'll bear with me. 
She says, a friend asked the other day what percentage of people I went to youth group with deconstructed and what percentage remained evangelical. And as I thought about it, I realized that for the most part, it was the kids who took their faith the most seriously who eventually walked away. Those who tearfully promised that we would follow Jesus anywhere eventually followed him out the door. The queer kids, more than anyone, learned exactly what it meant to work out our faith with fear and trembling. They told us to read the Bible and take it seriously and then mocked us for becoming social justice warriors. Now they're warning us not to deconstruct to the point of meaninglessness, but they took a chisel to God until he fit in a box. They deconstructed the concept of love until it allowed them to tolerate sexual abuse, to celebrate white supremacy, and look away from kids in cages. Some of us got to where we are because we took it to heart. We took the most foundational elements of our faith to their natural conclusions. Folks who deconstruct evangelicalism aren't dropouts. They're graduates. End quote. And that thread is a sermon in and of itself, but it reminds me of the necessity of also reconstructing after deconstruction. For all of the church's discussion of deconstruction, we have very little conversation about what to actually do with post-deconstruction. See, like the thread says, people who deconstruct, particularly people who deconstruct from conservative Christianity, are seeking something deeper. They're thirsty. Something more satisfying than the traditions in which they were raised. We have something to learn from people who deconstruct, who deconstruct from a variety of traditions, not just conservative evangelicalism, even within our own walls, because they point to the cracks in the system. People who deconstruct are prophetic. People who deconstruct can call us into a deeper understanding of the word that we call good news and to learn to take it seriously as good news. I can testify that I am a stronger person of faith for having been thirsty, for having been caught out in the wilderness. Psalm 42 is a psalm of lament clearly, but also a call to remain steadfast, even in the midst of drought. The wilderness is hard, but it is full of wonder. If you watch and wait that there and trust that there is something deeper to be found in its untamable vastness. And if you and, and know that if you're in the wilderness right now, it doesn't last forever. There is another side to the doubt. You can come out stronger for it. But now, settle in and take heart. And I love the way that this psalm ends, and it ends with the speaker taking that heart. And I'll close by reading it again. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall praise him, my help and my God. I'm going to say that again. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. Amen. Thank you.